Variability, check. Heritability, check. Differential survival and reproduction, let's go. Define and compare here selection differentials and selection gradients. Calculate a selection gradient and explain when it's used. We're going to use it a little more next week when we uh, cover the next topics and actually do this in class or on your own. Calculate and predict the effects of selection and conceptually just kind of get the headspace of multi-directional selection. So let's get started with selection differentials. This is what you're calling the difference between your, um, your survivors, so that's reproductors, and the, uh, the mean. So the survivors versus the mean. What happens there is if the survivors have higher reproduction than the mean reproduction, then it's going to be a selection differential. Here we have different tail lengths. So certain mice are going to have a longer tail, and the ones that have a longer tail on average are going to be reproducing uh, a little bit higher. So they have a higher fitness. We're, now we're looking at the difference between the means of those ones that reproduced and the ones that did not reproduce. It's a binary choice. So that's what we're looking at is reproduce or not. It doesn't allow for a lot of finesse within the selection um, differential. Oops. Um, within the selection differential, it's not allowing for a lot of real um, difference. As you see here, when we actually looked at it by a gradient, we'd be actually looking at survive. They either have three offspring or zero offspring. So that's where this differential becomes binary. A gradient, on the other hand, gradients are not specifically binary, but are going to be comparing how much. So we're calculating in the next topic, but it's really looking at the differential divided by the variance of the trait, or more specifically, oops, your each individual is going to be relativized to the group. So the standardized trait is, up, is on the x-axis, and that's your individual, how, how much the individual has, you know, how tall, how, um, how much red flower coloration, how long the seed pods are, all this kind of thing. That's the individual trait minus the average for that population divided by the standard deviation. So how much do you vary? How much variance exists on average? So how much is your variance compared to the variance? It's got a mean of zero. So this actually helps put these traits in, you know, centering it around a zero because it's either negative or positive with a standard deviation of one. And then it's going to be uh, calculated as fitness too. So we're going to calculate the fitness of each individual as their reproduction minus the average reproduction. <clears throat> this is going to have a mean of one um, and what's going to go on here is you have a mean, the, the, the mean of zero for the standardized trait and the mean of one for fitness allows us to really narrow down and kind of put in a graph each population. So here's a field site, site K1, Stottlemyer Trails, north of Paulsbo, Washington. And that, that site, the standardized seed mass, results in a higher, um, a higher amount of attack by beetles. So bigger seeds get eaten by beetles at a higher rate. Okay, that's kind of cool. Um, not much of a higher rate, but you can see the slope of this is actually your selection uh, gradient. So what you're measuring is the slope, and that slope is 0 0.06, or basically a 6% change um, in seed mass is going to represent a, um, a, sorry, a change in seed mass of one is going to represent 6% seed mass change, an eight, eating change in beetle fitness, the number of beetles that are eating it. Complicated. Anyway. So it shows how much change there is, and the higher the slope, uh, the more change per unit standardized trait. Yes. Um, you can see that, however, if we can do this by multiple years. And this is an important thing to do with any selection gradient, because as you may have noticed if you read more into the Finch studies, uh, the Finches had a selection gradient for larger bills would have higher reproduction. So that's a selection gradient. <laughs> However, <coughs> under different conditions a few years later, larger bills actually resulted in a lower fitness. So this means that you're going to have selection going one direction and selection then turning around and going the other direction. If this were with an annual species, which reproduces every year, then what you're going to get is stabilization. So too small on years where selection goes for larger, the next year they'll be larger. Too large on years that select for small, they'll get smaller and they'll stabilize over time given different selection gradients over different years. For perennials, however, with that inter-year variation means they have good and bad years. 
And if over a long period of time, a plant has more bad years than good years, then that plant is going to be selected against in the population. So for a perennial plant, or an animal that has a that is seasonally interop produces offspring every year, um, you're going to have good years and bad years resulting in differential fitness each year. Cool. And uh, let's think about predictions though. We can do some interesting math with this. I've taught you how to calculate h squared. So how heritable is a trait? How much selection is on the trait? So we, we know that the uh, the slope of the line between mid-parent and mid-offspring is going to result in that h squared value. And you have an s value of the slope when we're actually looking at this, um, the standardized versus the fitness. So how much does the trait result in fitness versus how heritable is the trait? You have differential survival reproduction multiplied by heritability, and um, you're going to get your predicted response to selection. In years where you have a high, um, high selection, it will move, but it won't move unless there's also a high heritability. So we can see here with, this, uh, with these mice with the long tails and the short tails, it's somewhat heritable, but not incredibly heritable. So the H squared is not the strongest, but the selection gradient is very strong because only the long tailed mice reproduce. So you end up with this trait will evolve. Let's look at another example done on alpine sky pilots with bumblebees. So sky pilots are these, um, these plants that grow on, mont on, in mount on montane meadows and they're pollinated by many different types of bees, including, of course, bumblebees. Bumblebees are more common, bigger bumblebees, in the alpine tundra, and uh, other bees are more common in the lower area. So how long does it take for selection by bumblebees, which bigger bees, they like bigger flowers, how long would it take for bumblebees to increase the flower size by 12%? Well, here's where common garden is useful. You're going to get that maternal corolla flare, so the, uh, the, the mother's size, and the offspring size, you can't get a mid-parent because they didn't actually know who the father was. Kind of a problem there, but you would get the mid-parent value if you could do controlled crosses. And uh, then you get the relative fitness. So plants with a larger corolla are going to have a, uh, a higher relative fitness. So you've got heritability measure and you've got a, an S measure. And after 13 years of growing these, they found out kind of how, um, how much fitness it could change based on how much the trait changes. Um, it was predicted that they increased the corolla size rapidly, about 1.5% per generation. Um, it actually took, this takes seven years per generation. So um, they actually saw a 9% change per generation when it's a selection by bumblebees in a common garden where they took plants that were small, took plants that were large, put them all together and let the bumblebees pick. The bumblebees picked the large ones. And you can see that with the offspring of the bumblebee pollinated plants, um, it's primarily the larger one. The ones that are hand pollinated carefully, uh, it was, you know, no real selection to kind of eliminate selection to show that bigger plants don't naturally produce more flowers. They kind of had um, no real change, but the bumblebees really picked this 14 to 16 millimeter corolla flare. So 9% per generation means in two generations, you would have a change of 12% quite easily. So that's how we can use a selection gradient you know, how much change in fitness comes from each unit change in, um, in trait. We can use that and how heritable that trait is to calculate how much, how fast things can evolve. And things like HIV, where you have a strong fitness differential. It's a differential there because you either are AZT resistant or you are not. A strong fitness differential and a high heritability of that trait because it is a strictly genetic trait you can see how fast HIV can evolve within maybe one or two generations. So kind of nifty there. Now let's look at multidimensional selection. This is a nightmare and a half. Um, not really. What we're thinking of is we just have, instead of having one standardized trait on the x-axis, you have a standardized trait on the x-axis and you have a standardized trait on the z-axis. And when you have a standardized trait on the x-axis and one on the z-axis, this means the y-axis can vary in, you know, in uh, three dimension uh, in, a, in a third dimension. So here we have with a uh, beak depth and beak width. So it turns out that you know the ones with the and I gotta get closer to see this um, shallower beaks would have a lower fitness, but they have especially lower fitness when they have a wider beak. So wide and shallow beaks are going to have the lowest fitness. Um, narrow and 
tall beaks or deep beaks are going to have the highest fitness. So you see how this is a, a slope there. And that basically would select for bigger beaks in um, this dimension, but smaller beaks in this dimension. So you see how those two dimensions of the beak cause, two, cause uh, the y-axis to vary towards having um, deeper, skinnier beaks. Cool. What about when it's not just a plane like that? So here's some, you know, snakes on a plane, but it's twisted. It's twisted. What you have there is spots and reversals. Spotted or striped snakes, okay? Snakes that will reverse when they're being chased or snakes that will just go straight. So it turns out that snakes that go straight and are striped are going to, you're basically negative 1.1 reversals here. So very few reversals and they are striped. Um, the 2.5 on the stripe scale. What they have is they have the highest fitness because they don't reverse, they just go, and it's hard for the predator's eyes to kind of track where the head is. Um, snakes that reverse, though, when they're striped, it becomes very easy for the predator to track where the head is. You see, snakes that are striped and have reversals are the ones that have lower fitness. Snakes that are spotted and have reversals, however, they confuse the predator more, and snakes that are spotted and have reversals have higher fitness. And snakes that are spotted and have fewer reversals have lower fitness than snakes that are spotted and have reversals, but higher fitness than snakes that are striped and have reversals. And thankfully, you don't have to memorize all those snaky, snaky facts. I just want you to grasp your head around how if you have two dimensions in space, um, you can have different levels of fitness based on where you fit on that dimensional scale. And uh, this could not just be strictly binary, but that each one of these could be a gradient. Cool. And now I want you to pretend you can wrap your head around maybe what happens if you have three different dimensions affecting fitness. You have to plot, it, plot the whole thing in four dimensions, or five dimensions, or six, and you get the idea. A whole bunch of traits are under selection at once, each of which has its own selection gradients or differentials, and each of which has its own amount of heritability and alleles that are causing it to be inherited, causing a complex suite of different ways to select for things. In the next one, we're going to actually cover the simple modes of selection and pretend that this is all a lot simpler. Um, review it, check the book. The book has some good snake stories, and enjoy. The next lecture will be a bit of a, bit of a breather for you.